Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we're interviewing my friend, Jeff D'Angelo, and the topic is the supply chain is broken. How to fix it. How's it going there, Jeffrey? It's great, Joe. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Jeff has been on my podcast before and I've talked to him because he was working with Turbo and now he's got something brand new, but he is one of those guys who's been there, done that, got the hat. Actually, he's wearing the hat today. So <laughs> this, is, this is good. So Jeff, please introduce yourself and your company. Yeah, my name is Jeff D'Angelo. This is my 20th year in supply chain logistics. I spent the first 13 years of my career working for, at the time they were startups, but they grew up as organizations. I was with TQL from about 30 million to about 700 million in revenue. I helped found a company called Megacorp Logistics, now is over $400 million. And then uh, I founded Turvo with two other partners. That company is growing like crazy. It's a software platform. I recently left Turvo to become a managing partner of a company called Lighthouse. And our job is really to transform, or my job is to transform the business to become more digital and really solve problems in a different way, rather than just be a transactional sort of logistics services company that manages transportation or warehousing. And we also have our own trucks. So it's how do we bring all those services together and do it digitally? Nice, nice. So of course, you guys use Turbo over Lighthouse, right? Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I joined. You know, I was going to start a company called Hello Street. I use that for consulting now. I still do some of that uh, leverage effort consulting. And one of the big, the thing that drew me to Lighthouse was two, really two things. Number one is they had Turbo. So obviously I knew Turbo in and out and I could apply the same SaaS methodologies and Turbo methodologies to a services company. And the second thing was that the owners or the partners were all sort of aligned to my vision. They just didn't know how to sort of bring that to life. And that's why I'm here. I remember when I talked to you just after you just had left Turbo before you even jumped in here, you said, I love Turbo. I always will. It's my baby. But wherever I go, I want to be able to use Turbo the way I want to use while I was still there because you've always felt like it was this fantastic platform that was used, I don't know, 70, 80, 90% by some customers or 60% by some customers. And you wanted it used 100% or more. You get the full brunt of its force. <laughs> yeah. It, Turbo was designed to solve, you know, problems through a tech first lens. And our customers at the time were really looking at this as a way to go to market and sell differently versus, hey, how do I use this as my holistic strategy, right. which is how do I create automation? How do I connect everybody together? How do I drive down the cost per transaction and make a better experience for the ecosystem? Right, right. It's funny because you see this all the time with technology. The technology people know what it can do. And when you see a customer saying, just like Jerry Seinfeld's dad saying, oh, I can make, I can figure out the tip <laughs> with this calculator. <laughs> You're like, yeah, it does a lot of things beyond just the tips. <laughs> so, That's right. But let's go back to the beginning. So where'd you grow up and where'd you go to school and how did, what was your first logistics job? Give us a little bit of that background. Oh my goodness. That's funny. So I worked for a trucking company, actually Forward Air in Columbus during college. And I swore to myself, I would never get into logistics after that. <laughs> but, you know, I went to my, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I went to Miami University and my first job out of school was working at Nielsen, the ratings company, AC Nielsen. And I wasn't happy there. I called an old professor at Miami and I said, hey, look, you know me, I just, I want to work my tail off. I want to figure out how do I make a lot of money. I want to make a big impact somewhere. Where should I go? And he gave me uh, Ken Oaks and Ryan Legg's phone number. They're the founders of TQL. At the time, they had no software. <laughs> we were doing everything on paper trays. You know, there were future shipments, shipments today and shipments on the road and very similar to how CH did it, right? From left to right versus top to bottom. And that turned into software, software focused. And I love the business. I fell in love with building logistics companies from the ground up because every day you were trying to solve problems. And whether it was internally or externally, it was like golf a little bit where every day you had a shot to do something different and something great. But obviously, I was frustrated over time that we were so focused, you know, both the companies I work with early on, we were so focused on 
how do I create more monetization opportunities for our brokers or our teams? Then how do we solve problems for our customers? And how do we solve problems for our carriers? How do we be the link between them in a way that, that creates sort of an elegant solution, not just from a transportation perspective, but from a supply chain perspective? So thinking much more broadly. And part of the challenge was our business model. And we'll talk, I think right. you and I talk about this a little bit later. Right. So when did you start Turbo and what big hole did you see in the market at that point? Started Turbo in 14, but we started talking about building Turbo in 2005. So I was still at TQL and a buddy of mine was at Microsoft. He would come back from Seattle once a year and we'd have dinner and I'd say, Hey, come watch me work. And he, what he was trying to do is figure out he was an entrepreneur by nature. He was trying to figure out how to or what industry to go into to build a software company. And as we started talking about logistics, he's like, man, this is messed up. And we kept coming back to one single problem in supply chain. And that one problem is something that I've always been focused on. And that's why Turbo exists. And that's there's no common tool set for people and organizations to work together. 70% of shippers have no technology, right? That's a target audience for my new company today. Right. The other 30% you know, have silo technology. Think right. of the problem is really tech. It's the fact that technology was built for a single audience type and it wasn't built for you and your ecosystem. Right. And so, and so that was a big theme for us. Yep. Jeff, this kind of brings us maybe to our first topic, but this is one of the things we talked about when we were prepping. We've created technology in the space, which is fantastic. I mean, uh, when I first, I was an automotive guy, so I was a uh, supply, more supply chain guy. When I first got to a logistics company, I was so impressed by the software. They had this cool TMS and I'd never seen it. And it was like, oh, that's fantastic. And I, I mean, I was excited to go to work to use it. I was excited to share it with customers. After a while, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, everyone's talked to us about a TMS. And then after a while, I started realizing it solved a problem that was a week long in the process. As a automotive guy, as a CPG guy, you have ordered a cache end to end. That's how you think. And the TMS talked about transportation managed a few one week periods of that, which was great. It was fantastic. But what I think what you wanted to do at Turbo was say, Hey, these guys need end to end. They need order to cache and traditional TMS is again, two, three days, maybe a week. And, you know, if you're talking about freight forwarding, it's, you know, a month, but it's still, it's piecemeal solutions that just went with the rest of the piecemeal solutions. That's right. And it's not enough. That's right. <laughs> and I think the biggest, again, going back to the biggest problem with software, it w wasn't just that it wasn't looking holistically, right, at supply chain, but that it wasn't a connected solution, right? Think of how prevalent EDI is today still, right? It was created in the 50s. Right. And, you know, when we, my current company, we go talk to big shippers, the first thing they ask us is, do you do EDI? Right. And for me, I want to destroy EDI because it's, it actually doesn't, it's not real time. It doesn't solve the problem. And, and so at Turbo, going back to why we started Turbo, it was how do we bring all these companies together? And so, it, you know, we build an architecture just like Facebook, just like LinkedIn to be able to sort of distribute the data across many different players that had to work together. And some people say, hey, is that blockchain? And I would say that it's very similar in that it's a distributed ledger concept that everyone can have access to, but it's also public, private, and you know, it depends on what people want to share. Right. So I think it's super interesting how we try to solve that problem. Right. So again, the topic today is the supply chain is broken. So the first thing you feel like is broken, as we just talked about, which is the software. We got a software problem. We have all these different softwares, a software up here for order management. Then I've got one for my TMS. I got freight forward. I got all these different silos. And so the, this, the software itself, it was great solutions individually. I'm again, when I think back 10 years ago, when I saw that TMS, I thought, Oh my God, this is fantastic. And now if I look at it, go, yeah, it's limited. It's yeah. limited by what it's actually doing. And then when we realized, oh, all these are limited, let's integrate them. <laughs> we got really good at integrating all these systems. And what you're saying now, I think, is you don't need a whole bunch of different systems all integrated if you can get onto a, what do you call your... What's a collaborative, pl a collaborative logistics and supply chain platform. I think the other thing when we talk about why the services models are broken, right, which is part of this, is that too many logistics companies think that they're software companies, that they should just build it, right? There's stuff you can build for sure. I absolutely believe you should build some of your own stuff to help you differentiate. 
But when you build your own platforms as a services company, all you do is re-silo the industry. So if I go into a company and I've got XYZ TMS, then that customer typically can't have that data. It's their data, but I basically own it because I own the, the license to that TMS. And, you know, if I want to rip it out, like they can't work with other providers. Right. And so one of the things I wanted to push on this company was how do we solve this appropriately? And it's through Turvo because it's a network. We'll give them Turvo and they can work on Turvo with their other providers. We don't really care. Right. So you said something to me this when we were still at Turvo when I was asking, you know, why is Turvo different than a regular transportation management system? And you said, well, it's not a transportation management system. It's a collaborative logistics platform. And you said it's more like LinkedIn or Facebook. So that's how you look at Turvo. What would you look at like a traditional TMS, like a plug into LinkedIn or plug into Facebook? I look at it as a standalone cable box, right? <laughs> like think about it as that's not connected to the other cable boxes. Right. 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 Where it's not distributed across different I, so I can interact. Yeah, it's it's a small app that is it's a, a single purpose app almost. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so again, we talked about the supply chain is broken, and the first thing you think is broken is the software. Again, it's all these different silos, no common tool set. We have visibility for like local areas that just gets getting shared from place to place, replicated from place to place. So, Jeff, what is the second big problem with <laughs> the supply chain that is broken? So, you know, across the supply chain, I think one of the challenges that's created from having siloed systems or no systems, is that it just creates a bunch of manual work. And I'll give you a bunch of examples, at least in the business that I'm in today. When I was at Turbo, we had a customer that worked with one of the largest CPG companies in the world. And whenever a shipment was running late to their customer, they got a phone call. And that phone call said, hey, where's the truck? And they would call their four layers of customer service. The bigger you get, the more layers you have, right? Right. By the time it got to Costa Rica, they would call the carrier and say, where are you? They would call the driver and say, where are you? And then by the time it got all the way back to the client, the client said, yeah, the driver showed up. Right. And so that's just one example. There's a bunch of examples from an inventory visibility perspective, order management, you know, where's the order? Even in invoicing, I have a million sort of examples of, of how oh, yeah. invoicing becomes you know, manual across multiple companies. And they're big businesses that are built off that manual work, right? I could name right. several of them. Right. And so what that does, right, you have a bunch of people in a room making phone calls or emails or whatever. You know, if you're a, a services company, you're doing that work. Your customer's doing that work. Their customer's doing that work. The carrier's doing that work. And all it does is forces your cost per transaction to go way up. Right. And, you know, and it's interesting because I think we've also kind of trained the shippers, our customers in this business that you're going to be able to do certain things that are made. I'm, I'm going to send Jeff an email. I'm going to call Jeff and say, hey, is my truck on time? You go, yeah, you could go to the system and look. No, I like calling you because I like you. And and I'll send you an email. And I think we have to retrain customers. And I, when I was still at a 3PL, I was tempted, this goes back seven, eight years, tempted to say, hey, for anybody who wants to call in on their LTL shipments that are in the system and can be checked on the portal, we have to add some sort of transaction cost because I, I shouldn't be taking all these phone calls in our office saying, yeah, it delivered. Can you see the system? Yeah, it delivered yesterday at 4 p.m. You got, you already have this information. So we've trained our customers to get used to this manual work too. They're doing some of it. But I think there's a new, a new wave of people, at least on the shipper side, that are used to Facebook, LinkedIn, and all these consumer yes. apps that just want to be told when something's going on automatically, programmatically. And I think that's what our software allows us to do. Right. And you know, I, we have customers. It's funny you mentioned training the, the clients. We had customers in my, at Turvo that would literally ask me, can you create a delay to notify me first before the truck's running late and then notify the customer <laughs> so that we can? And my question was always, why? Like they want a better experience. Why don't you give them the same visibility and transparency that you have? And it creates more automation and customer happiness. Right. Right. Well, and again, this manual work kind of brings us to another thing, which is we're seeing margin compression. So not so long ago, I had Felipe from LoadSmart and he said, hey, you know, we talked about the margins being 14% in this freight worker business now, maybe moving down to 13%. As that cost of transaction keeps going down, you have to become more 
automate it. It can't all be a whole bunch of manual processes. And you can't always just lower the cost with manual processes. You need that technology to do it. That's right. I think, you know, Jeff Silver sort of built a machine up a coyote and, you know, their margins were so low that anyone else trying to compete just couldn't do it because his incentive model to his people was different than the traditional spread business model. And I think... was it, to Explain what that spread business model is just for those who don't know it. So typically in the 3PL or brokers world, they get paid by the difference between they, what they bill a customer and what they pay a carrier. So when you think about how companies compensate their people, most brokerages compensate them on the percentage of that spread. And so when you build compensation models, you typically try to build one for the behavior that you want out of your people. Right. So if your people are 1,000% focused on driving that margin, right? They don't care actually about solving a problem for a customer or carrier. They care about, hey, how do I make more money on each shipment? Yeah. So if you're working with somebody and I say, hey, I'm work just my customer and I really take great care of him. And by the way, I'm the highest uh, paid person here and my margins are higher than everybody else's. And everyone's like, hey, good. Does Jeff know that? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> He's going to ask for a decrease because because well, you're not funny. aligned. Yeah. Not and, aligned. And, and, you know, I remember a conversation I had with the head of logistics at General Cable years ago. And they worked with the largest freight broker in the country at the time. And they were making, he'd go look at the 10K and he'd be like, they're making 18%. I don't know if they're making 18% on me. I don't know. And are they adding that much value to my operation? Can I insource it? Should I outsource it? Like, what's the value that you're creating? And so when we talk about automation, I absolutely think the transactional nature of the business should be driven down but to single digits through technology, right? Whether it's offshoring certain functions. I absolutely love the offshoring model for certain functions of the business because the cost is just so much lower and it adds right. tremendous value. Right. We were just talking about that lean, how lean's been on the podcast before. Lean Solutions Group, they've got a whole bunch of people down in Columbia who understand this business really well. There's thousands of them. I think there's hundreds of companies now that have outsourced back office stuff and very successfully. And one thing that happens over time when you start outsourcing stuff, you think, well, that's just a lower cost resource. No, they become the experts. We've seen that with China. There's certain pieces of the U.S. economy that we moved to China that now they are better at what we outsourced it 30 years ago. Now they're the experts. That's happening. Yeah, and, and those functions, when I look at the cost per transaction for most brokerages, and I would look at that in 3PLs, I would look at that as part of our sales process at Turbo. Most of them were over $100 a transaction. $125, $150 a shipment. And it goes back to the 1 million per person ratio, which is most 3PLs, you know, for, for every million dollars have to add a human being to manage it. That's going to change, right? That's going to change where you should be doing 50 million or 10 million, you know, per person and your cost per transaction be single digits. And that creates different ideas around business model transformation. And that's what customers want is they're willing to outsource and pay for the service. They just want to make sure they're getting the value out of the money that you're making from it. And I think it's very simple. Right, right. So the first problem is the software itself, all these different silos, and which have to replicate systems to keep moving information along, keep integrating, integrate, 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 rather. And so you say, you got to get away from that model. You got to go to this more open model. That's the collaborative logistics platform. Second, you talked about this too much manual work as we keep trying to drive down that cost per transaction, as we get to that single digit margin for transactions, that's going to be driven by tech. It's going to be fewer manual processes. The manual process will be stuff that actually a human has to do as opposed to we just got used to doing it. And Joe, I think what logistics companies, 3PLs need to think about is their customers doing that work. That's a problem that they can solve for their customer to automate that function. And instead of saying, hey, how do I get your freight? It's how do I solve the problem that you're manually telling your customer when things are late? You're manually collecting docs. You're manually doing certain things. We should do that work. We can, we're the experts, to your point. We can do it at a much lower cost and we can do it for a small fee. Right. And I think, Jeff, this requires all of us in the transportation logistics business to grow up and say, start being those end to end partners. And again, everyone, you want to overuse the term partner, but Rather than say, oh, yeah, I'm the key to your business and I'll get you a truck. The supply chain might be 16 weeks long and you are doing something that's maybe a week long. And I think we have to say, how do I go further upstream? How do I go further downstream and keep adding value? Because that's going to be where 
the future dollars are for us. Well, think about, I mean, just think about lead time for a second. Like, why are so many logistics companies focused on the shipment entity, right? Versus saying, hey, if I go upstream in orders 30 days in advance, or to your point, how many was 16 weeks, then I can understand how do we move stuff around to accommodate the shipper to drive my pricing down of the transportation and give my carriers more lead time and actually provide that as a service. Right, right. So what is the third reason the supply chain is broken? And then how do we fix it? Well, I think all this leads up to business model transformation. Going back to the spread, I think the traditional business models are not built and designed for the future of the industry. Meaning, if we have brokers making $500, $700, $1,000 per transaction and aren't adding any value, then they should be disrupted, right? They absolutely should be disrupted. And so the way I'm looking at our business is, how do we shift to a more transparent, meaning I want them to know what we make. Because we're actually solving the problems for them and we're worth that money. And we're doing it in a way where we're getting a larger share of the wallet. We're looking at orders. We're looking at inventory. We're looking at shipments. We're grading the carrier base. We're actually doing this on behalf of the shipper. And if we make a small fee, the shipper is so excited about the value that we're creating that it doesn't matter. They'll pay it hand over fist. Right. Jeff, I got to tell you, so years ago when I still was in transportation at a 3PL, I had one customer and I was close friends with these guys. And when I wasn't working with the owner, I was working with the, the shipping guy. And I remember he kept saying, oh, this is ridiculous. These costs are too high, blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, I would come in and find out that we had to expedite two or three of their shipments that just should gone LTL. Then I find out that they wanted a full truck to direct for a uh, rather than an LTL. And I remember I was like, oh my God, like we're so overpaying. So they complained one day and I said, can I come over? Because they're in Detroit area. I drove over. I brought all what I, all, <laughs> for the last week, I brought all my invoice, what I was invoiced by the carriers and what I billed. And he's like, oh, so you're just going to show me what you made? I go, eh, yeah. And he goes, oh, look at here. You made 800 bucks on this one. I was like, yep. And he's like, hey, keep going. And he said, oh, you lost, what'd you lose 200 bucks on this one? I was like, yeah, because I told you something, right? And at the end, he looked at the number, he goes, that's not so bad. And I go, that's why I'm showing you. You keep thinking I'm ripping you off. And it was, for me, it was kind of killing me because he kept acting like, this is ridiculous. I'm paying so much. per." But the reason he was paying so much is because he wouldn't listen to the advice we were giving him on, hey, could you give us a little bit of notice so we don't expedite everything? And that's the transparency you're talking about. Yeah. And as everyone knows, it's been in this industry, the power flips. Like right now, it's hard to find capacity, Right. right? (laughs) And so you've got all these carriers that are out there and brokers that are taking advantage of that power shift. And to me, I look at it, I'm agnostic of power. I, like, I don't really care. What I want to do is solve the problem for the next generation, which is how do we create alignment on pricing so that when it does go up, you know, we're not, our services company is not taking a bath, right? It's not losing money. And the customer understands why. And maybe we look at other areas that we can solve for, like, Think of cross-organizational consolidation of orders, right? Like, why right. don't we we group together these customers and start saving them money as almost like a co-op would? So, I, you know, to me, there needs to be business model transformation. I actually think, you know, there's going to be people that test the subscription model. Let's say, hey, for a hundred bucks a month, I'll give you this service. You, you know, you pay the care, or whatever. And you know, we're going to test some of these things out. I think we're early. But essentially, what we're trying to do is find companies that shippers and carriers, because I think the carrier market is fragmented, just like the broker market is fragmented, like the shipper market, that want to be a part of a journey for more transparency across both. If a carrier says, he's making too much money on you, and the shipper's like, no, he tells me what he makes on the shipment. Right. Doesn't matter. Right. Jeff, when we were prepping for this, we talked about this, the idea of the stockbrokers. There used to be, and for, for young, younger people, I'll explain the, <laughs> the system here. You used to have to, if you wanted to buy a stock, you didn't go through Robinhood or E-Trade or, you know, TD America. <laughs> you had to go call a stockbroker. And he would say, oh, you got you got $15,000. Yeah, I'm going to get you into some Dell stock here. And that was the hot stock then. And he would charge you three, 400 bucks to get you in. And then... And then you make some money and then you go, hey, I'd like to cash that out and buy something else. It'd be three, four hundred bucks to get out. Right. And those guys convinced themselves. They said the same thing brokers do, which, hey, it's all about relationships. It's about relationships when your industry becomes commoditized. So those guys, and it's funny, when you go to the uh, stock brokerage, all nice offices, they have the glass offices and the guys were all what? 
tall, good looking former athletes. They slap you on the back, talk Sounds about familiar. Talk about <laughs> hunting, talk about going to the ball game. Yeah. When are we gonna get together for drinks? And he was making a killing on his on his customers. Yeah. And guess what? Nobody could go around them until we had Schwab that disrupted the market. It really didn't take that would have been seventy eight, but it really didn't take hold till the internet. The internet, all of a sudden everyone's like, why am I paying five hundred bucks for these transactions? We looked at those trends, you know, when we started Turbo. I think that was one of the, when we went to talk to, to potential customers of Turbo, it, we would tell the story of Charles Schwab, exactly. That, you know, he had a room full of stockbrokers that he said, mm-hmm. hey, I can replace those with servers, drive my cost per transaction down and create more automation. Right now, I fully believe in quality. I think we talked about the idea of coffee, companies like Starbucks and Blue Bottle that have you pay more for and you're willing to for the customer experience. Right. And I absolutely believe that there's a, a, a premium piece model. Of that. There's definitely a premium model, but 80% of the transactions should be automated. And I think we talked right. about companies like LoadSmart, et cetera, that were automating the transaction. Right. And what we're trying to do is kind of a little bit of both, right? Is how do we create as much automation using tech to drive it? but also have a model that allows us to have an expert that can talk to customers and carriers. Right. And so Jeff, we didn't, when the stockbroker model more, it's still, there's still stockbrokers out there, but not as many, but those guys moved. They didn't evaporate. Those guys still exist and they segued into money management. So talk about, and I think it's better aligned. So talk about that. Yeah. So I believe the future of 3PL is more like that, right? Where you're offering a variety of services. So at my new company, we have trucks, we do warehousing, we have supply chain management, think of managed transportation services, we have brokerage. And again, it's a collection of services that you provide, but the fee structure is going to be different, right? In the way that you monetize those things. It's not just a transactional broker that says, hey, I can get you a truck. Our right. job is to become a partner and provide value and have a totally transparent model. So you see what we see for a small fee. Right. Yeah. And it's the same with you. Look at those guys now. If you go to one of the money managers and say, hey, look, I have a million bucks. I want to put it in here. And they say, yeah, we're going to look at your total financial picture. We're going to talk to you about your insurance, your mortgage, your retirement, your kid's college. We're going to talk about what you want in your life. In fact, if you see all their ads, they're like, the ads are never about money. It's the ads about people, good looking people sailing at 55 years old. That's right. <laughs> right? Here's That's me right. at my, here's me and the Bahamas, right? It's all about what are your life goals and how do I help you get there? And I think we're going to switch the same way. We're going to say, look, we're not going to be those transactional brokers who are looking for the big spread. We're going to be the guy who says, hey, your end-to-end supply chain guy, your partner, that's me. I'll help you with everything. I got your warehouse. I got your technology. I get your trucks, expertise, resources, whatever you need. Yeah, and you see these tech-enabled companies that are doing that. Flow Space is an interesting one. I don't know if you know much about them. Flexport's trying to diversify, obviously, their portfolio of services. They're doing domestic now. And so I think the tech players are going to start start moving in. And that's what I'm basically trying to do is say, how do you take a really nice size 3PL, make it all digital and do transformation in the business model? Now, that all affects how you operate, right? Your operational model can't be the traditional cradle gray broker or you know name your favorite thing you have to have a different support mechanism and you have to apply it in a way where your cost is lower so you can offer that that differentiated business model yep so jeff we talked about a lot of different things here so i'm going to summarize and i want to get your two cents on it so the first thing we talked about why the supply chain is broken is the software we got all these different silos no common tool set is and use the term creates havoc <laughs> lack of visibility so we're replicating information for all these different systems and integrating. So that first is software. Second, you talk about just tons of manual work. As the cost of transaction goes down in this industry, you're going to have to find a way to get part of that. You're going to have to find a way to lower the cost. Nobody should be paying for a guy to be adding information when the system can do it. That's right. Number three, it's this idea the business models aren't aligned. We can't keep doing the spread. We can't keep we can't stay in the same model. It's just not going to work because you foresee and other people foresee the margins going so low that the existing model doesn't work very well. Right. Imagine a world where everyone that has to work on an order or a shipment are using the same tool, right? I always look at the future. What does the future look like when there's trucks that drive themselves, there's drones, there's automated warehousing, and what role does the human play, right? So 
to that point, I think of setting up companies like what we're doing now to provide that type of software and technology to the ecosystem, whether we're operating the shipment or not, doesn't matter. The second thing to your point is how do I drive the human, not out, but drive the human into the process when they can add the most value and automate when they don't add any value, right? So, right. you know, if I can make a check call, an automated thing, an automated ping, why would I have a human being do it? So that's right. number two. I think in the last thing around business model is imagine a world where we get paid off of a KPI that our customer has internally. We're aligned. We're yeah. aligned. We're completely aligned. And it could be a small fee. It could be, hey, you know, we saved you a million dollars in your freight spend this year. Whatever that is, it needs to be a more collaborative approach to the business model. Transactional stuff aside, I think that more companies need to get more deeply rooted into the companies that they work with. Excellent, excellent. So, Jeffrey, before we go, tell us about your new company. What's new over at Lighthouse? Yeah, so like I said, I joined as a managing partner of this great 3PL in Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati area. They are a customer of Turbo. The company's called Lighthouse. They were Lighthouse Transportation Services. We bought a trucking company called National Transparent Logistics that had trucks as well as warehousing. And then we have a packaging division as well. So the idea is how do we go broader with our customers to support, basically to support their business? The one big thing that was missing or the couple big things that we're missing is how do we make everything digital? So right now we're working on tech adoption, both internally as well as with our carriers and our customers. So we can create a bunch of automation. We're looking at areas where we can create automation around, you know, think of either offshoring or even, you know, RPAs in some way so that we can drive that transactional cost down, the manual effort down to create a better customer experience. And the third thing I'm really focused on there is when we go to market with our customers and we're starting to have these conversations now, we've only been there a month, is how do we get more ingrained into your business? They love the service. But now how do we take this and get more deeply rooted into their business and provide a business model that grows with the customer, that not that, hey, it's a one-sided approach. Right. And so we're trying to do sort of all three things at once. And I think our company is going to look very different next year than it does this year in that we're going to have a digital fleet concept. You know, we're focused on how do we bring on... And what is a digital fleet? <laughs> well, digital fleet is how I think about it is Everything's transparent to the customer and the carrier and the 3PL and whoever works in there. And the fleet would use Turbo as well. So how do I track it in real time? Documents are uploaded through the tech. Every communication is through the messaging right platform so that we're doing all the booking through there. Now, the digital fleet, whether it's our fleet, it could be a fleet of owner operators at least on to us, which I think our job is to create a flexible solution to allow new drivers to come on and make it easier for them to make way more money because the tech does a lot of the automation, right? So that provides tremendous value to the customers as well from a visibility perspective. We didn't talk about that today, but I think what we're doing on the fleet side is super interesting. The other thing I want to get into, I think that's really, really cool is as we start working with our customers to provide a more deeply rooted sort of partnership in technology is how do we get them to all work together to create optimization around, you know, it's kind of the thing that everybody wants, but no one could do, which is how do I take orders from multiple customers, digitally consolidate them, right, to save them money. And we can do that with Turbo. We're just not ready for that yet. I think in the in the next six to 12 months, we'll start approaching some of our clients who have LTL and sort of half loads to do some of that work. Yeah, that's fantastic. So who's your main customer? Who do you guys serve? So traditionally, we've served a lot of different organizations. I think over the next you know, six to 12 months, we're really going to get focused on areas that we do really well, which is small to mid-sized shippers that are, have a refrigerated freight. We, have a, we do a lot of produce, actually, a lot of refrigerated business. We also have a nice flatbed group that handles flatbeds. So those are two massive areas that need visibility and collaboration, right? And we're providing a lot of that. I think the van industry is super saturated. And I think what we're trying to do is find areas that have a need for this type of sort of business model and approach. Excellent. Excellent. So what I'll do, Jeff, is I'll put a link to your new uh, endeavor here, Lighthouse. What is it? Lighthouse AI? So we just rebranded. If you go to our website, it's www.golighthouse.ai. Okay. And so it was lighthouse-trans.com. So because now we have all these different services, we're consolidating them under more of a tech tech focus so we can be more tech enabled and that goes to our branding as well. Yep. So I'll put a link to your new website and put a link to your LinkedIn profile. How else do we reach out to Go Lighthouse AI? 
Yeah. So you can always email me, Jeff at golighthouse.ai or anyone else in the group. You can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn and all the social media sites. And so, yeah, the shippers, brokers, carriers, it doesn't matter. I think our job is to really focus on the industry and how do we make all boats rise. Excellent. Excellent. Well, this was great, Jeff. I really do appreciate you taking the time. And it's interesting because I have a lot of conversations about different systems. And one of the things I really like about this, what you guys have done at well, first, what you did at Turbo and what you're using now is this idea that it's end to end. It's rather than just solve the problem of the one week where I'm moving freight. It's from the time I got an order to the time I get paid. <laughs> I want a system. I want a partner. That's so right. this is good stuff. I appreciate you taking the time to talk about it. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate the time. And good luck with the new endeavor. Love it. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Talk soon. Thank you. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, Onward and Upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversations with experts in the logistics field. If you're an expert and would like to be featured on the Logistics of Logistics podcast, please email Joe Lynch at joe at the logisticsoflogistics.com.